So without further ado, I'm going to ask him to step up here and just release what God has given us. Let us stand to receive the man of God, Apostle Sidney Stairs in the house. Amen. He brought a powerful message this morning in Spanish. He's about to be used by God in a powerful way in English. Sidney Stairs for the glory of God. Amen. And I like his shirt. How about we give the best applause to the one who really deserves it? To the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Come on, you can do better than that, everybody. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Without him, we are nothing. My honor to Pastor Carlos, his wife, Jenny, for this wonderful work that they are doing here in Killeen, Texas that affects the rest of the world. My honor and respect to Pastor Andres and his beautiful wife, Maria, and all the rest of this pastoral family that is going to a, a, a great job. I don't believe they, they have an idea of the impact that this ministry is causing around the world. This morning in our first service, I said a few things about my wife, and she wrote me. She said, I saw and heard everything. You just wait till you get home. <laughs> oh, my God. Praise the Lord. How many of you give God thanks for this wonderful worship team? They just escorts us to the presence of God. They're, come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. You can have the best musicians, the best sound, multimedia equipment, but you don't, if you don't have a worship team. You know, one thing is to play music. Another, uh, you know, one thing is to sing. But the next thing is to be able to worship and take along the congregation with you. Beautiful work. Uh, what's your daughter's name? That uh, uh, Rosalie. Wonderful work, Rosalie. Hallelujah. Praise God for this beautiful family. Uh, before you take your seat, please take your neighbor by the hand. Praise the Lord. As I told the saints this morning, my first language is... English, but I've been preaching in the entire Latin America since 1983. And can you believe I began to forget my English? <laughs> that, that, that is crazy. I mean, hallelujah. So whatever um, you hear comes out in Spanish, ask the Lord for the gift of interpretation. He, he, will, he will help you. And I've been living in Puerto Rico since 1989. So in Puerto Rico, we make up words. We invent words. I mean, we enhance the Spanish alphabet. So that is something very particular of us. Praise the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this celebration, for this anniversary. We thank you for this service. We thank you for your presence. And we know that wherever your presence is, there is deliverance, there is joy, there is happiness. And we pray now, God, that you will just show us your glory. Do whatever you have in mind to do. I stand aside what you work. And we pray, Lord, that you would not allow us to leave this place as we came this morning but that you will do something for us. Do for us what you did for the early church, the first century church. Because if you don't do something for us, there's no way that we can stand and go forward in the season and time in which we're living in. Help us, we pray, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Yes, if you're going to clap, clap because it's for the Lord. Amen? You can take your seats. Thank you. 
This is such a beautiful day, and it's uh, my privilege to be able to celebrate with you these uh, three years um, of Revived Church. And God has shown me that many churches have been birthed in this city to conquer and ended up being conquered. But God has put this church through a series of experiences that have equipped and is equipping this church for the times ahead. This is a ministry of the last days. Middle East is a time bomb. It's clicking. And uh, we're about to see and experience things that Humanity have not experienced before, but have only read about in the Bible and in the prophecies. So this church has 18 years of experience, but Revived Church has uh, three years. Uh, this is our third year anniversary. And you know, it's been like the Lord has been pulling back this church because you know you can't have a bow and arrow and the further you want the arrow to go is the more you have to pull it back are, are you understanding my Puerto Rican English <laughs> so sometimes it doesn't make any sense what God is doing but it, it makes all the sense of the world you are not here by accident even those that are here for the first time, maybe you came because a friend invited you. You are here because God wants to do something with you. But then again, uh, whatever happens here in Killeen, in this local ministry, has a ripple effect around the world. Amen? Thank God for social media. We can reach places in the world that we never thought that we could reach. And the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are going into all the world through social media. But also, when the Bible speaks about going into all the world, the world begins with you, your neighbors, your neighborhood, the place where you live. Sometimes we confuse world with planet. Planet is one thing, you know, planet is, is tangible. You, it has to do with rocks, stone, volcanoes, lakes. That's the planet. Rivers, sea, dirt, mountains, grass. That's the planet. But when it speaks about world, every time you wake up on a Sunday morning and get ready to go to work, you're going into the world. You know, world, if you are in the medical realm, you're going into the world of medicine. If you are a beautician, you are in the world of beauty. If you are a teacher, you go into the world of academia, education. So when the Bible speaks about going into the world, it has to do with you on your job place wherever you work, and that is your congregation. Sometimes it's so easy for us to come to church and criticize the pastors. But let me see your congregation, what it looks like. Let me see your work site. Let me see those who work with you. Are they being transformed? Are they being converted to the Lord? Because that is your congregation. Let me see your family. Are you affecting your family positively? Hello? There are Things that are happening in your family. Don't blame the pastors for it. Because God has called you to affect your family. So many times, you know, in uh, uh, last year, November, I celebrated my 50th year in ministry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this October, last month, I celebrated 40 years of uh, missionary life. Um, 50 years in ministry, not because I'm that old, <laughs> but because I, uh, I started very young at the age of 15. 
And I have been through all the different departments in the church. Amen? Even uh, doing messages for the pastor. You know, ironing his handkerchiefs and his shirts and whenever we were on a mission. You know, so leadership begins with service. Amen? So in 50 years, I have seen a lot of... I've not seen it all, but I have seen a lot of things, you know, that, that uh, God is helping me to use to help other people. So when I say that whatever happens here has a ripple effect of, around the world is because I know in my spirit God has shown me that God has purposely caused this church to be birthed again the last three years despite the fact that Pastor Jenny would have wanted to choke her husband when he said, we going at it again. <laughs> so that's the reason why we are here. Because of the vision of a man, a vision of a woman, a vision of a, fam of a family, when it was much more easier for them to say, you know what, we give up, we have been through too much stuff, we don't want anything to do with God's people, or even with God, because we have had so many different experiences that, that were heartbreaking for us. But this church exists as a testimony of what God can do with what's left over. He takes the little and he turns it into something great. So this is an abnormal church. You're going to see growth like crazy. And the growth is going to be persistent and it's going to be lasting. Because we are talking about a, a, a family of pastors that have been seasoned and prepared for such a time as this. And the church is going to continue to grow in the measure in which you understand that you are also a pastor for your family. You are also the pastor, the coach, the mentor for the people that you work with and that you work around and that they work around you. There are some parties and celebrations that you cannot take them because your family will become very upset if they shut up. Why did you bring the pastors to this party? Now we cannot... You know, because the man of God, the woman of God is going to be watching. You know, but you can go. I'm, I've, I've, I've met so many believers that they become ashamed of their family. So I don't want anybody to know that they are my family uh, members or, or acquaintances. You should not be ashamed. That's the congregation that God gave you. So in the measure in which you can understand this, and begin to work for the salvation of the souls of these people God has placed in your hands, this church will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow again and grow and grow. Then we will have a capacity problem. Sheep bears sheep. Hello. Uh, you don't want to hear this. So, for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about five steps to move forward in the, in the midst of crisis. How many of you feel like you should be more advanced in your lives than where you are right now? Yeah, maybe you should be. Okay? We're living in a world of crisis. There's crisis everywhere. There's no country in the world that is not in crisis. You know, I was born in the Republic of Panama, and I have lived now in five countries as a missionary, including my country, because I was a time out, I was at a time 
out of my country, then I came back as a missionary, going into fields and areas, you know, to reach the, the, the lost, the unsaved. And Panama is developing so quick and so fast that it was being considered as the Dubai of the Americas. I've been in Dubai. Dubai is a precious country. Dubai has the best of all the world. You know, every good thing you have in the five different continents, you can find it in Dubai. I mean, I was blown away when I saw what was, uh, what's happening in Dubai. So Panama, where I was born, you know, you see that skyline? I mean, that, that's such a beauty and, and uh, fast-growing economy and people uh, being uh, going down there to retire and what have you. Panama is in crisis right now as we speak. People are in manifestations, uh, uh, protests all over the city, and, and it's, it's something that is heartbreaking to, to see the condition that the world is in. But so is the United States. The country is in crisis. We have crisis everywhere. We have governmental crisis. We have political crises, crisis. We have religious crises. One, one of the uh, problems right now in the Middle East has to do with religion. Religious crisis, you know? And uh, family crisis, all kind of crisis. So when we hear the word crisis, we, we tremble. Because none of us like crisis. You know, but crisis, when you study crisis in the Eastern world, uh, crisis means victory turned upside down. So in the mind of an Oriental, uh, the Far East, you know, he knows he's going through crisis, but he's waiting for the moment because he knows that, that in any given moment, that crisis is going to turned into victory. As Pastor Andres was saying this morning while, while he was speaking, he says, victory, victory is ours. God has not designed a single defeat for any one of us. When God wrote the history of our life, defeat is nowhere to be found. The Bible said we are more than victorious. I think you didn't hear me. We are more than victorious. Touch your neighbor on the shoulder and said you are more than victorious. Praise the Lord. So five steps to move forward in the midst of crisis. The question is not whether there is crisis or not. We know there is crisis. So number one, identify the times that you are in. First Chronicles chapter 12 I want to read two verses in chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles. The first verse is uh, 23. And I'm going to read uh, from the, the New International Version. Initially, I was going to read in uh, King James. But the 23rd verse in the New International Version, it says, These are the numbers of the men armed for battle. Who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him as the Lord had said. So God had spoken. God says David is going to be the next king over Israel. And uh, he began to send people that would turn the kingdom over to David. In other words, it's a transition. Transition are tedious. It's it's uh, tiring, you know, it's, it's uh, like, let's get over with this already. You know, you're in a transition right now listening to me. <laughs> so I, I hope that by the time I am through, you would know why you are here, where you came from, and where you're going back when you leave here. Okay? So... There is a transition that's supposed to take place. David is supposed now to become the king over Israel. And these men, they came to David to help him in that transition. I don't believe I'm here this weekend by accident. Because 
I don't take this body just anywhere. After 50 years of traveling, it comes a time you don't want to see another plane. It comes a time you just want to kick back and watch Netflix. Are you listening to me? I don't know about you, but I'm a human being. <laughs> It, it, it comes a point, the only thing that you want to look at is your wifey and telling her, let's play. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, I don't take this anointing just anywhere. So if I'm here this weekend, it's because there is a divine purpose involved. Are you listening to me? So whenever God begins to do a new thing. Say a new thing. Come on, shout it now. A new thing. Whenever God decides to do a new thing in a ministry, in a church, in a family, in a marriage, in an individual, he begins to send to you the people that are going to help you in that transition. Some of us, we are so full of the spirit of suspicion. That God would send people into our lives and we would shun them away. Because crisis can cause blindness. In your crisis, you shut the world out and you shut in to your room and you say, I don't want to speak to anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. They're all a bunch of hypocrites anyway. There are three of you today, right here, right now. You are sick to your guts with all the scandals you have seen in churches. I can point you out. But let me tell you something. There's still a few of us that we do things right. Because we love God. We are afraid of God. And we are afraid of our wives. <laughs> My wife is a triple prophet. <laughs> prophet, prophet, prophet. And it's not easy living with a prophet. Because they do crazy things. And they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You want to sleep and they're doing warfare. It's like, woman, go to bed. <laughs> So, number one, identify the times that you are in. Verse, let us read the, 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 these, these other few verses. Verse 24, it says, From Judah carrying shield and spear, 6,800 armed for battle. From Simeon, warriors ready for battle, 7,100. From Levi, 4,600. 27, including Jehoiada. Uh, leader of the family of Aaron with 3,700 men, 28, and Zadok, a brave young warrior with 22 officers from his family. 20, uh, verse 29, it says, from Benjamin, Saul's tribe, 3,000, most of whom had remained loyal to Saul's house until then. Verse 30, from Ephraim, Brave warriors, famous in their own clans, 20,800. Verse 31, from half the tribe of Manasseh, designed by name to come and make David king, 18,000. These are not just any kind of men. These are specialized. These are special forces. We are talking about a king. The pastors here are seasoned pastors. And you're going to have a parade of apostles, prophets, elders, evangelists, pastors, ministers that I know that are going to be coming in because God has a special plan for this church. And because of the plans he has for this church, he's going to be Send them specialized forces to help you to get to where you need to go. And because of the destiny God has for this church, it was necessary 
all the things that happened in your past. I'm talking to a few people today. Because I'm talking about them as a ministry, but I'm also talking to you as an individual, you as a couple, you as a family. Some things that have been happening in your life makes no sense to you. But I tell you what, it's going to begin to make more sense this coming week. Can somebody say amen? amen? Verse 32. Listen to this now. Verse 32. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. This was a specialized tribe in Israel. The sons of Issachar, they knew the times. They would look up into the skies. They would study the constellations, the stars. And uh, they would know what's happening and they would know by divine inspiration what Israel should do. You want to know what's happening in the world and what you should do as an individual, as a couple, as a family? Continue to worship. Continue to come to services. Don't substitute your time with God with other things and other stuff. Because that is what the church is for, the local body of believers. This is not religion. This is the house of God. This is where you come to receive information to go back into the world and make sense with what you see around you. Anybody getting this? So, the sons of Issachar, I mean... These, these, you don't mess with these people because they knew exactly what's going on and they knew what Israel was supposed to do. Now, basic instinct. If it's cold, you have cold weather, you cover yourself. If it's summertime, you drink a lot of water to avoid dehydration. If it's rainy weather, you cover yourself so you don't catch a cold. If it is time of scarcity, identify the correct land where you are going to sow the correct seed into. The kingdom of God is always the best place to sow. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, that's very basic. Now, number two, identify who God is using and what they are saying. If they are going through the same things as you, it means that the crisis is not personal. So many people, they get angry at God. They say, I sow, I give first fruits, I tithe, I give special offerings, I come, I worship, uh, uh, and look at what's happening to me. I'm going through havoc. You know, if the person sitting next to you is going through the same stuff as you, that means it's not personal. It's just a cyclical experience. It's going to be over soon. Amen? Amen? Now, if everyone is harvesting and you are not, it is because you did not sow when you should have. You planted the wrong seed in the wrong ground. Or you sowed the right seed at the wrong time. In the midst of of the crisis, God would have a spokesperson announcing where the path is. The world needed a savior, and God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord, who said of himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. John the Baptist came announcing the Son of Man is coming. So I'm here to prepare the way for the way. Makes any sense? So 
Number three, see how quick I'm going? Number three, trace a clear map of where you are and where you want to go. If you don't know where you are, you won't know what your starting point is. In this era of hyper-information, we are less informed than ever. Because there are so many people making noises all over the place. There's so much information that we don't know where we're going. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will direct us into all truth. The Holy Spirit has been trying to direct a few of you a long time ago. But you are full of confusion because you're not being directed by the Holy Spirit. And you're not being directed by the Holy Spirit because you are not given the Holy Spirit the time of day. See, you and I, we did not send ourselves here. We were sent by God as ambassadors. And if we are ambassadors, that means that we are very important to God. And if we are important to God, that means that they are talking up there important things regarding us. You know, the Holy Spirit, he forms part of the trustee board in heaven. He knows everything that, go, that goes on up there, but he knows everything that goes on down here. Are you following me? So Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will direct you into all the truth. It also says, he would let you know what he heard. What he heard where? What he heard in the board meetings up there. In regards to you. And the only way you can find out what is being spoken of you in those important meetings up there about you. If you will spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So glad you're listening to our podcast. And we're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful. And you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. So how do we do that? He comes, he wakes you up at 2.22 in the morning. You open your eyes, you look at the clock, you say, oh, man, I got to sleep because I need to go to work tomorrow. Or he wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning or 3.33 in the morning. You go, oh, man, I need to drink some uh, something that, you know, re- that will relax me so that I can sleep at night because I'm not sleeping well. And then you, you go to your doctor, I'm not sleeping well at night. When it's the Holy Spirit being trying to... To get you to pay some attention to him. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes, he wakes you up. Get up. Go into a corner. Kneel in his presence and shut your mouth. Because he is the one who's going to speak to you. You understand my Puerto Rican English? Don't you dare... Kneel in his presence and tell him, oh, God, change my husband. Oh, God, change my wife. Oh, God, change my children. Oh, God, no, you keep quiet in his presence. If you want to do prayers of petition to the Lord, do it on your own time. You choose another hour in the day, and then you take your list of petitions, and you go before him. Prayer is the rights of any citizen of 
the kingdom. Your prayers are petitioned before the king. And you have that legal right to go before the king and tell him everything that you need. But when the Holy Spirit wakes you up or call you into his presence, you kneel in his presence and you keep quiet. He's going to talk to you. And he's going to tell you, you need to call so and so today. You need to write so and so today. You need to do this. You need to speak to your boss. You need to speak to the people working around you. He's going to tell you exactly what you need to do. And he's going to direct you into all the truth. We cannot depend on the information that is out there. The press is lying to us. Our government is hiding the truth from us. In the midst of a multitude, the one that is going to receive more followers is the one that shouts the loudest. Somebody say, how can you identify the voice of the Holy Spirit? If your mother was in the midst of a hundred women and she started calling your name, would you be able to identify that voice? Of course. You know why? Because you became accustomed to her voice. The time will come in which you are so accustomed to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you will know it's not your mind talking to you. You will know it's not your imagination. It's not some demon trying to confuse you. You will know that you know that you know that you know that it's the Holy Spirit. In this time of crossroads, we need the Holy Spirit desperately. The early church was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, with all the gifts. Because otherwise they would not have been able to stand against the evil forces of its time. We are in a time of too many dangers. In other words, we cannot allow ourselves to be disconnected from the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not come to give you goosebumps. As we see some places... I was born again in the church of God in Christ, an Afro-American Pentecostal church to the bones, hardcore Pentecostal. I can do my praise breaks. I've been among the bishops and the archbishops, but I realize I'm not talking bad about anyone or anything. But I realize that, that if I'm going to make any sense in this generation, I'm going to have to stop jumping and start teaching. Because what is ahead of us doesn't smell right. So this is a place of information. I don't know if you came to hear... <laughs> A preacher that will put you to jump, that will make you dance. Oh! Or if you came to hear someone that will help you open your eyes and realize something is going on that ain't right. And we need to get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. If you don't know where you are, you will know what your starting point is. If you don't know where you are or where you want to go, (laughs) 
you will have a destination problem. You fill up your Jeep with gasoline, and then uh, you start the car and just go. You know, your wife asks you, honey, where are we going? I don't know, wherever the tank will take us. You have a problem. Because you might end up in some hillbilly mountains that <laughs> you have dreamt that you would never want to be at. And they're going to welcome you, all right? Welcome to hillbilly land. We have been expecting you. <laughs> it will be your worst nightmare. You better know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you can end up anywhere believing that's your, that was your destination. My question to you today is, who are you? Where are you from? What are you doing here? In other words, what's your mission? And where are you going after your mission is finished? If you can't answer me these questions, then you are consuming oxygen that the rest of us need. If you can't answer these questions, then your life on planet Earth would not have worked while. One of the things that most terrorizes me is standing before Messiah and hearing him ask me, what did you do with what I gave you? It terrorizes me. Because after so many back pains, hip pains, sciatic nerve pain, knee pain, headaches, Stabbing in the heart by people committing treason against me. Backstabbers. Backstabbers. They smile in your face. After going through all of that on planet earth and having the Lord ask me, what did you do with what I gave you? Die of a heart attack. Immediately. I want to hear the words. Welcome, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a few things. No, I will put you over a lot of things. So what are you doing here on planet Earth? You did not send yourself. Somebody sent you. The same body that sent Adam to planet Earth. Adam was a piece of dirt until the Lord blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Some people say, I don't believe in religion. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in a thing. Well, you already have a religion. And it's called humanism. Me-ism. Me. I. Me. Myself and I. I take care of me. I do what me needs to do. Me doesn't need anybody else. Number four, what things do you need to get to where you want to go? If your obstacle is the sea, you need a boat. If your obstacle is a mountain, you need a rope. If your obstacle is air, you need a parachute. It is very important for you to remember that God, the creator, does not operate the same way as we, as we, as we do. Noah, Moses, and Jesus had the same problem, a problem called water. Noah built an ark. Moses used his staff, and Jesus walked on water. So, whatever you need, God is not necessarily going to supply the way that he did it for Pepe or Juanito or for Mark and the other guys. God is Elohim, 
Elohim, the creator. God can create things a thousand times and each time do it differently. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? So, what do you need? <laughs> please, 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 get your weaknesses out of the equation. Too many times we use our weaknesses as an excuse for God not wanting to use us. Look around you. Each and every one of us, we have a weakness in our life, including us pastors. And we pray, God, take this weakness away from me, and, and he won't. Asking God to remove our weaknesses is like Adam telling God, get this tree out of the Garden of Eden. Because every time I look at it, I am tempted to eat from its fruits. God did not remove the tree. So God left it there as he left our weaknesses in us. And the idea is for us to develop character. Every time we wake up in the morning, we open our eyes, that weakness is standing right next to your bed looking dead at you. God's plan is for you and his desire is for you to look back at that weakness and tell it, I am going to defeat you today. The day is done. You lay to sleep. You were victorious. Heaven applauds you. But for some reason, if you succumbed, if, 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 if you yielded to the weakness, weeping would endure for a night. Because you feel guilty. You, you feel ashamed. God, I did that thing I didn't want to do. Weakness endures for a night. But joy comes in the morning. You know why? Because his mercies are new every morning. If you're going to clap, you better clap. Because it is God's mercies that have brought us this far. If it wasn't for his mercies, we would have been consumed a time ago. Fifth and last point. What are you going to do once you arrive at your destination? Once you reach your destination, you would find humans, you would find animals, and you would find territorial spirits. My wife, I made fun of her <laughs> the first service, and she texted me, I saw everything. <laughs> When I met her, this beautiful young woman, and she would walk in her heels like this. You know, I, I can't do it because my back problem. <laughs> you know, and, and her hair always, you know, mm, just made, made me want to eat her up. You know, yanda. <laughs> so we were living in a city. And one night, I'm laying down in the country. How would you say campo, aquí? In the country. On the outskirts of our city. Surrounded by trees, rivers, chicken, dogs, ducks, geese, iguanas. I have some iguanas in my backyard like this long. And those things, you tell them, get out of my backyard. And, and they will go like, mm. <laughs> They come and they eat the fruits from off our tree. Anyway, she wanted land. She wanted to, to sow and reap and get dirty. Now she gets real dirty. And I'm like, you fooled me. You 
you are not a city girl. You're a country woman. Puerto Rican hillbilly. <laughs> Being certified as we speak as an agricultora. Agriculture, you know, involved in, that, in those, all those things with bees and fumigation and irrigation and all those, those stuff. Sometimes I look at her and her hair, this nice hair. I tell her, go to the beauty. No, because I go to the beauty. No, because I go to the beauty. Because I'm the man of the house. <laughs> I hope she's not watching this. Sir. You know? So... She wanted, we were living in a condo, beautiful condo. I mean, it was just remodeled when we bought it. But she said, I want her. She started planting uh, avocado trees on our balcony. And I'm like, do you know that thing is going to grow? She, she's like, yes. And that, I said, what are you going to do when it grows? Because it was on our balcony and it touches the ceiling. What are you going to do? She said, I want land. And this Puerto Rican woman, I mean you. They'll curse you. Mira, pepe, ya, ya, yo quiero. Okay. Anyway, we went to see this house. And she grabbed me by the collar. She said, I want this house. And because I don't want to have problems with a Puerto Rican woman, I said, okay, we buy the house. <laughs> so there was no AC in the entire house now we have but back then no. you know that night I could not sleep and I'm hearing all these nature noises and this what is that oh it's a frog and she would identify each one of these things I'm like you are a hillbilly how oh, you know that no offense to the hillbillies here congregated today. I became one myself, okay? So, the lady that sold us the house is because her husband died in the house. And she repented. She didn't want to leave the house. So, the day that we were moving in, she was moving out. And the, the other house she bought, and this is going somewhere. This is going somewhere. The other house she bought, her, her things can fit there. So she left one of the rooms filled with furnitures. I mean, it was touching the ceiling. And we are here, 122nd of December, 23rd, 24th, around boxes, month of December. And I started seeing the ghost of her husband. You say, how do you know it was the ghost of her husband? Because he was the one who died in the house. So you say, I don't believe in ghosts. Well, sad for you. I saw it. <laughs> so I wouldn't say anything to my wife nor my daughter until they started seeing it also. So I say, oh, so I'm not crazy um, I've been seeing it, but I didn't want to say anything. So I called that lady. I said, come remove your stuff or else. Little dots. So she came. She took out her stuff. So then I told that spirit. I said, you cannot continue here any longer. This property belongs to me. I anointed the house, the doorpost, the window post. I declared the blood of Jesus entire, the, the whole property, and that thing left. Fifth and last point. Once you reach your destination, you would find humans, animals, and territorial spirits. With humans, you would have to fight face, face to face. Lady, get your stuff out of here. The house is legally ours. Animals will move away on their own, but you would have to be careful 
that they do not come back when they are hungry. You would have to cast out territorial spirits because if you don't, they will not let you enjoy your new level of conquest. Some of you, you bought a new house. You say, we have a beautiful house. That's it. You know, and all in a sudden you started having marital problems, family problems, job problems, financial problems. It's not just the fact of moving into a new property. You have to cast those spirits out. You have to do spiritual warfare. You have to establish yourself and establish the kingdom of God in that place. So, in other words, when you go out into the world to take God into the world, wherever you are moving in the world, you establish the kingdom of God because you are an ambassador of God. A lot of professional people, they follow me. People, entrepreneurs, you know, the uh, medical, uh, what, you just name it. And so many of them will tell me, I cannot work there anymore. Why? They're treating me wrong. Take possession of the place. I want to move from job. You staying right there. Why? Because God established you there. Kick those spirits out of there and establish the kingdom of God. Once you arrive at your destination, you would have to tear down and build, scrape to be able to paint, be ready to endure the criticism of those who jealous you for your new level of conquest. This church is celebrating three years. Praise God. I'm very proud of you. I congratulate you. But the happiness we are experiencing in this place today is not the same happiness that others have. Because as I said, many ministries were birthed to conquer in this city, but ended up being conquered because they did not know why they were placed there. Once you arrive at your destination, some people will leave your life but you would have new neighbors. The higher you climb the mount of success, the lonelier it gets at the top. Some people are in your life for a long time. Others are only for a season. In your conquest, you will learn to appreciate those who criticize you because they help you become better. Judas will only help you fulfill your, process, your, your, your purpose. So thanks, Judas. Bye. Go hang yourself now. Where you are headed to, some people don't belong there. As much as you love them and you want to pull them up the mountain, it's exhausting for you and tedious for them. In conclusion... We all need Jesus because only him holds the map of our life here on earth. Many of you believe you are terrestrial. But in reality, you are not. You were sent here on a mission. You received anything from this? I want to pray for you. You know that you are not as close to God as you should be. Maybe you have never given him your life. You want to do so today. Having realized that you are not an accident. You are not the product of dad and mom having intimacy where dad and mom could not see them. God does not waste life. Life is too precious for God to waste it. So you are in this lifetime with a divine purpose. 
and for a divine purpose. I want to help you pray. I may not see you again, or at least in a long while, that is. So I want to enhance the opportunity and pray for you today. God is not looking for disciples. The church may be, but not God. God is looking for sons and daughters. Some of you are exhausted from running from God. God has been running you down for a long time. And he's running you down not to punish you, but to forgive you. A tower, a high place is the name of the Lord. The righteous run to him and they receive salvation. Stop running from God. Because he is the only one that can save you, clean you, forgive you. So run towards God. So if you've been running for God, from God, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Is that you I'm talking to? You need to come close to God. You need to restore your relationship with God. You need to come to God for the first time. You need to fix your life with God. Is that you? Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Come, come. Now is your time. Now is the appropriate time for you. Come home. Come home to Jesus.